hello everybody. Uh, yes, this is the last uh, uh, official talk, but I'm not sure what Shrikant has in store for you guys. Uh, yeah, more is more is always good. So I'm, I'm just gonna start with a quick uh, uh, sort of recap on how um, I got here, and I'm, I'm talking to you guys. So Shrikant and I spoke about uh, two or three weeks back about RootConf, and he was explaining me all the cool stuff that you guys. Uh, that all the sessions had in store and um, all the DevOps audience and the developers audience and the more he uh, he explained to me it uh, it resonated with what we are uh, dealing with on a day to day more on an enterprise side SMB side and um, I requested him to give me the audience to just talk about uh, some of the challenges that we are seeing in the field about uh, scaling databases. So so Shrikant was uh, was okay with the, you know letting me talk but. He asked me for one thing that the proposal that I had sent had this uh, title, and he said, "This is not catchy enough. It's too geeky." So he said, "Can you can you come up with something more cooler?" I did not. Uh, that's why they're still on the official conference. But hopefully, databases, the unsung heroes. That's what I have come up with. This, this is the best I could do to generally talk about databases and how what are the scalability challenges there. And what are we trying to do there? So let's set the stage. I think that's I'm going to be just uh, introducing you guys to the problem. Um, I think over the last two days, I've heard a lot of discussion around scalability, which is great, which just proves the point that there is a need or there is a problem out there about scaling, and there are multiple solutions. I'm just going to propose one uh, uh, alternate architecture. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll take you through a quick data center evolution as as I see it and where databases stand and what are the limitations in current architectures. Um, then uh, we'll talk a little bit de uh, into details about the uh, specific problems as such and try to relate to you guys on why a DevOps guy care about this problem, um, why, why even a developer care about this problem. So we'll try to relate these couple of things. And uh, the solution that I have is uh, more presented in a generic form. And there are multiple solutions coming out from uh, some in open source communities, um, some more commercial. So I'm just going to present you a quick landscape so that you, know, you guys are aware of them. Um, it's possible that some of them uh, are being used by you guys. So just quickly do a summary of what's out there. And then we will go a little bit deeper into this uh, uh, architecture, what I call is a database access layer. And what does it have to offer? What use cases does it bring out? And, uh, and how does it help you? And that is where the majority of the, of the technical discussion would lie. And I just, uh, like to uh, sort of brainstorm with you if any of those use cases resonate with you, what you're doing in your infrastructures. Similarly, you guys are the you know, gatekeepers of everything uh, uh, in the data center. Uh, and then we will do the Q&A. So let's start with uh, a, a quick personal experience. So back in around January or February of this year, I got this uh, email from a very famous uh, airline in India saying, oh, there is a big sale out there for tickets. Go buy it. It's what, rupee one or something, that's what they claim. So I got very excited. I said, okay, I need to fly to Delhi anyway, so let me just go to their site and, and book my tickets. Let's see what I get. And uh, this is what I got, and literally, and this was, the email must have hit my inbox. I clicked right away. The site was down. What's, what's the point, right? I mean, you're doing a lot of advertising. You're doing a lot of your marketing around all of these things that you're trying to sell, but you're your application, your website are not ready to handle that kind of load. So you know, my reaction to this whole thing, right? Why can't we test uh, our application, our site for scale? And well, it's easier said uh, than done. I mean, there are lots of uh, parameters out there in the play. As we all understand, uh, application is not just one piece in itself. It's a Everybody is deploying multi-tiered applications. You have web servers to deal with. Um, you have some solution to scale your web servers. Then you front them, front end uh, those web servers with some sort of a load balancer. 
works good. You add some sort of a caching. Yeah, your web servers are looking good now. Uh, what about your app servers? I mean, the app servers have to be written in a way that they can scale. Um, so we have some interesting solutions there. You have solutions like Hadoop and whatnot coming in to break down your your data sets, your your computation into smaller pieces that they can be executed. But at the end, when you go and your app tries to do some data access, it still goes to the database. So that's the uh, that's the part where most of your business lo business logic data is living. And I'm here to just uh, uh, focus on one aspect of this, which is the databases. The things go wrong when uh, your application is scaling at the database layer itself. And that's what I primarily want to deal with. So um, let's start with a quick recap on what I, what I thought has been happening in the data center. So we started off by uh, you know, ID craftsmanship, I and mean, that's where um, we started the data center in a way that, okay, it's meeting a one-off departmental need, you're provisioning your, uh, your uh, data center in a, in a, in a more uh, efficient way, you know, your virtual machines are, are coming up so that you don't, your physical resources don't go wasted. Um, but then the IT revolution said, okay, now we need to develop this as a service. This has to be a self-service model where I will give you the tools uh, as a DevOps guy, I'll give you the technology, and you go serve your own business. And the third one that we are seeing now is, yes, there is a lot going on. Yes, we have all the cool tools to, um, to uh, automate our DevOps, but how do we extract business value from it? I mean, the CIOs of, uh, of the companies are saying, fine, you're using this, these cluster data uh, databases, these cluster compute nodes, show me uh, something that that I can take uh, and improve my business. Uh, do I want to invest more money on app A or app B? Because ultimately, you know, uh, everything should be serving the business. So that's the sort of trend that we've been seeing. And, uh, you know, it started, like I said, with efficiency and now moving towards data. But, uh, but I personally feel that databases are still stuck in the IT craftsmanship uh, era. I mean, it has not come out of it uh, yet. There, there's still, I mean, if you look at the basic, the biggest database vendors in the world, MySQL, um, you know, SQL Server, Oracle, they're doing a lot of innovation in the databases itself to make them, you know, faster, more efficient, and whatnot. But they're not paying as much uh, uh, attention to the, to the trends that are coming up, the self-service models, the self-healing models, the models where the data itself talks to talks back to the to the user, may it be a developer or a DevOps guy or a CIO of the company. So that is where um, I think the gap is in terms of the database technology and the rest of the things that we are seeing in the in the industry. Um, so let's get a little bit uh, geeky and then let's let's see what are the challenges in the database tier today. So on the right, uh, I drew a quick diagram of you know how a web server to database connectivity exists today. But you see a bunch of web servers on top and have a mesh of connections to to the database layer, and they are all you know you know one on one uh, one to one connections. When you're writing an app, you're you're connect you're creating a connection string to say I want to go to database A or database B. And that kind of uh, programming is what we are doing. So as you see that this this kind of architecture is hard to scale up as your databases will start filling up you will have to add more and more nodes as you add more nodes how do you tell your application that a new node has uh, come around in in your infrastructure so it's a uh, it's a problem where you have to every time every time you scale up you have to do some modifications into your application stack uh, for it to be useful. Um, NoSQL is uh, trying to address that problem and it's saying, okay, we are a transparently scale out system. You don't care about how many nodes you have in the back. Your, your data is going to get scaled uh, efficiently, which is right. I mean, that's a, that's a one way of solving that problem. But then you what you're essentially trying to say to the existing app developers is that if you want scaling, then you have to re rewrite your applications to now 
NoSQL, which is uh, not always the right approach. I mean, you sometimes the applications are not suitable for a NoSQL like uh, a data store, and sometimes it's just not practical. So there are all sorts of challenges there. And what uh, what I am trying to propose is there is an alternate to moving to NoSQL to solve your scalability challenges. There are, uh, you know, we can, we can do that in a different way. Um, yeah, some of the other challenges is hard to maintain availability. So a database server goes down, what do you do now? I mean, you saw that initially the error message, you know, error connecting to the database. It's, I'm not sure, but I assume that a lot of people have seen this error. Because a physical server goes down, you can't do anything about it. Uh, you have to go in as a DevOps and you know, bring, you know, you know, debug what the server is doing, bring it back back up, and in the meantime, whatever applications have been using that database, you have to go change their connection strings to make them point to the other uh, database node. So, so that challenge exists, um, and it's hard to diagnose. Also, I mean, there is no visibility in the in the database layer as far as I see it. I mean. Um, in fact, yesterday it was very interesting because one of the Microsoft guys have, were showing a tool um, where they were trying to pinpoint the problem in the infrastructure down to the level of the SQL query. They were saying, okay, this is, you know, this is, you have a multi-stack environment. Hey, look at this query which is causing your databases to slow down because the response time is very high. That's exactly the kind of uh, point that I'm trying to make here. That it's, very difficult to diagnose what's going on in your data database tier, where the problem lies, whether it's in the app, because the app has, is writing crappy queries, or in the network, because the latency is very high, or on the database, because maybe the tables are not indexed properly and your joints are very expensive or your you know, disks are slower. So the visibility of the problem is, is also a big challenge in, uh, in today's uh, database tier. Um, so anyway, so, the, so this problem exists, and there is a lot of people trying to solve it in, in a lot of different ways. So some of the interesting projects uh, that have uh, that I would just like to share with you guys is first starting with the um, a white paper by uh, not not a white paper actually a research paper by uh, Google called Spanner. So as you all know, Google wrote the the uh, the big table uh, paper, and then you know a lot of NoSQL solutions were based out of it. So recently, they um, released another paper uh, called Spanner, where they are developing a geographically distributed uh, database. So their um, use cases um, for the for the Google AdSense uh, application, where all these databases are replicated geographically across the world, and you can uh, uh, write application now to query these databases, and these are relational databases. And in the paper, they actually point out that, um, hey, we introduced you guys to the to the big table world. Um, it's great for app some some applications, but we are feeling that that's not enough. Uh, that's not the right thing for a certain application, especially AdSense. So we are going to propose this relational model back again, but we're going to improve that for scale. We're going to improve that for availability because we can't afford that a certain data center goes down because of, you know, hurricanes in, in you know, Houston, and then um, it affects all my uh, Google AdWords. So it's completely distributed. They do replication on the back. And also second requirement that they had was, was transactions. They wanted asset properties back. They didn't think that the, moving the... Um, requirement of uh, consistency to application is the right thing. So, so they are doing something very creative. Uh, very recently, about uh, maybe a couple of months back, Facebook announced uh, another project called Web Scale SQL, which is actually a branch of uh, the community edition of MySQL, where they are solving uh, the, some of the scale problems. I mean, if you look at Facebook, Twitter, uh, and uh, uh, LinkedIn and actually Google also are they are the four main contributors to this project, and they have a large deployments of of MySQL uh, clusters, and they are suffering from the same problem that I'm sort of trying to share with you guys: how to solve scalability. So, so they are making some improvements in the database tier itself to address it. Um, MySQL has had certain solutions out. Uh, some of them, uh, like MySQL Proxy, have been around for a while. Um, which is the closest to what I will be talking about. It's basically a proxy server 
which lives between your web servers and application servers and your databases. Uh, and then it basically load balances and uh, uh, controls all the traffics. The, the architecture called you know, the data access layer that I'm talking about. So they have, uh, they have some solutions out there and, um, in the open source world. And Postgres also has a tool called PG Pool, which does something very similar. Um, in the commercial world, we have, like I said, the database uh, vendors are, are coming out with some solutions. Uh, Oracle has uh, um, Oracle Rack, which, which tries to address some of these things. Uh, there are companies like SkySQL who are coming up and branching off MySQL and then trying to solve this problem in a commercial way. Um, the dedicated data access layers like uh, like my company, ScaleArc, there are other companies like that uh, which are uh, trying to solve the same problem in a similar way. And uh, and there are ADC vendors, I mean, people who don't understand SQL as well but are in the space of optimization, content delivery. So they are trying to solve that by, you know, just uh, partially uh, helping the problem by you know, TCP, load balancing by caching of certain kinds and whatnot. But uh, I don't think that's, I, I don't think they go deep enough to really address the problem. Um, so, so let's look at what this data access layer can do for you. So if you guys remember the slide before that where there was a big mesh of connections, now this is the proposed architecture. The, all your web servers and application servers are now directly connecting to a single entity, what we are calling as data access layer. And then the data access layer then multiplexes these connections to the server, to the database farm that you have. So think of it, what does it mean to the application? So you can have uh, n number of app servers, and you first of all have to only configure them to a single endpoint. So think of it as, you know, a single IP address and a port, which says go here for all your data and database queries. You don't have to know about what, which one is a read, which one is a write. You don't have to worry about um, uh, when a server goes down, how do I recover? It's a single endpoint. Always go there, send your queries, send all your queries there. And what this data access layer does then is as it receives connections from all of these web servers and app servers, it can efficiently multiplex, uh, multiplex them. Now it can efficiently send reads to certain read servers, write to certain write servers, can measure what is the a replication lag between all of them, and we'll talk about those use cases in a minute, but that's a place now for you to do these, to solve these scalability issues. Uh, you can add transparently a new node into your um, architecture, and then you start sending traffic to it. App application servers are agnostic to it. They don't know. They don't care if a node comes up comes or goes down. Um, uh, one more use case that this uh, layer opens up is the uh, uh, real-time visibility of the traffic. So as you can see that, you know, this layer is accepting all the traffic, all the, all the SQL queries from the application servers. It can now do aggregation on your, uh, uh, on your queries and can have, and can drive business intelligence from it. This goes back to the diagram I was showing you where databases were stuck in the, in the first year, but they're not, you know, serving the business is because they were not, able to uh, uh, assess what, how an application is using the, the queries. But using this data access layer, now you can, you know, uh, get some very useful statistics. I mean, think of uh, an example. Um, you have an application which is uh, sending a lot of selects, a lot of joins. Uh, the basic thing that you can know now is how many queries per second am I running? Um, how many queries are going to table A versus table B? Uh, what is the average response time of my query? You, you make a change to your app, you add a new join there, and then you start seeing it in, your, in, this, uh, in this access layer, and is the business intelligence that can come out of it is, oh, now you have a new query that is, uh, that is running, and the latency is very high, and a developer or a DevOps can then show it to the developer to say, did you just make a modification to the app? Because now it's showing that your join is taking a lot uh, more time. So directly correlating whatever you, application changes you are making to the database tier. Uh, let's change this uh, uh, view a little bit. So what if you have multiple applications going through this database, uh, data access tier to your database? And you want to know which of my app is, uh, is uh, um, 
being used more and how where should i invest more money whether it's an app a or app b so because of the fact that now you can analyze all this data you can very uh, you can uh, generate very intelligent decisions from it you know based uh, on how your app is behaving and how is it using data so so that's another use case that i think this uh, this offers uh, instant scalability and higher availability we discussed the transparent cache is, uh, is something I want to talk about a little bit. So one more thing that uh, this data access layer does is uh, is uh, caching for you. And we've heard of uh, you know NoSQL as a means to serve data from uh, in memory. It has a key value lookup. That's the reason it is faster. You don't have to go to the disk all the time. But you can apply similar principle over here. So um, how it works is you get a query a read query like a select and let's say your uh, application is such that it sends a you know a lot of these select queries um, typical example is on an e-commerce website when you go to the page it loads the you know your basic uh, front page which has a lot of uh, um, items that you display that you're trying to sell now this is a static query because it's not changing often unless you go and change your your inventory in the back so you can assume that every select query that you are making every time somebody logs in is going to the database. You can choose to then cache this into this layer where the query will come to the data access layer and return back. And we'll talk more about that. So it sort of eases the pressure on the database tier and takes the complexity to itself and lets it do the more complex operations like transactions, which is what databases are good at. Um, security is another um, interesting um, area which which all gets uh, addressed by this layer. So, you, how many of you have heard of SQL injection attacks? Right. I mean, we are all aware of them. Um, this is a very um, nice place to to stop the SQL injection attacks because think of it that if this layer is seeing all the traffic all the time, and uh, it can also intelligently find out if a, if a new kind of query comes through it can just compare it with the with the traditional uh, traffic that it is sending and it can you know send an alarm um, that I'm seeing this brand new query that I've never seen before have you made an application change or is this something unusual uh, and then the administrator can go in and says okay these are the common SQL injection attacks that are that are, that are being um, that I'm seeing or this layer can learn itself and can automatically protect that that okay if you if i'm seeing some sort of a script embedded inside a query i'm going to block that i'm just not going to let it go to the database because that's that's where they're trying to steal the data from so so it it does very interesting things with the security as well uh, so I would, I would like to pause here for a minute and try to see if uh, all this is making sense do you guys have any basic questions before i go a little bit deeper into some of the use cases that I was talking about. All clear, Crystal? Uh, will that, uh, will this need any kind of change uh, as far as connection pooling is concerned uh, from uh, the application side? Um, so let me come to connection pooling in a second because that's one of the use cases I'll be talking about. Okay. But can I, it, it will enable connection pooling even though your application is not doing it. Even if you have a non-connection pool application, mm. you can now do connection pool pooling using this um, architecture. But if you do have connection pooling on your application, it will work hand in hand with it. So it does not affect that. It actually makes it better. All right, good. There's a question over there in the corner. You talk about the security, right? Uh, so it's possible for a XSS attack. What about the in case of a CSRF uh, requests? In case of what? CSRF, cross-site reference uh, for injections like that. Right. So the way, um, well, there are multiple ways to solve it. And ultimately, if you can parse a request out of a, I guess ultimately this is a network uh, proxy. So it is reading all the data that is coming in in a, in a, um, in a request you can as a system admin go in there and train the system with rules to say these are the kind of uh, attacks that i want to block 
a scripting block is another the kind of you're talking about is 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 uh, uh, is could be another one so it's basically a learning engine the more rules you create on it given uh, your you know, experience in the past it will do what it what you tell it to do uh, it is looking at every packet uh, at a packet by packet level and then can stop that but uh, it has been disaster has been disaster right yeah attacker can get through it after get throwing it only we can make it or set up the rules yeah, yeah the good so, point so yeah. I mean, yeah what's the what's the point of blocking some somebody something when things have happened already but i mean that's a more of a business use case there are some things that it can learn over time right i mean it's not that every time a new attack comes in typically you know some some sort of vulnerability gets introduced and yes, then yes. it's get it gets propagated what is more important is you don't suffer from something which is already known that's a bigger mistake that you are making yeah. so I mean, a valid point. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, uh, my question is regarding the cache uh, use case example which you've shared. So, uh, why would I want my uh, request to actually go through my application server and reach my uh, the database abstraction layer? Shouldn't I actually cache even before my application server? So, do you have any other use case which uh, probably is is like um, more more useful? um let me understand the question and actually i'll come to caching in just a second um but let me try to see if i understand your question you're saying why cache at the database yeah because uh, i can cache the page even before it, the request comes to an application layer right because Absolutely. it shouldn't yeah so it's not it's not sort of changing the the caching that happens at the http layer or or this uh you know um at the web layer it is talking about whatever you could not cache there and you, even if you're sending your select queries to the database you can still do another level of caching there because um, if all things that are read only could be cached at the web tier then databases should only have been used for transactions but that's not the case i mean i'll show you use cases where we've gone into environments where 90% of the traffic was read uh, the other question is uh, regarding the transactions so uh, does the layer also handles transactions which is distributed across uh, different uh, shards or like however you split so i'll come to that in just a second let me just go through that so i think okay let me just uh, walk you through this so it's a very simple architecture bunch of app servers on the top uh, at the bottom there are three databases the one on the left is the primary server this is the right server and the other two are the read servers we calling them secondary servers so given what we discussed so far this is the new architecture that looks like um so can let's talk about connection multiplexing it's a it's a very simple use case we already discussed that um, all the web servers all the app servers are opening you know hundreds of connections to this layer um, but those hundreds of connections doesn't need to be directly open one on one to one to the to the databases because um, as some of you might know databases suffer from the limitation on how many connections they can uh, uh, they can open at a time that's one of the very big limitations of databases and if you're if you're out of connections then you can't serve the web server so here given that you know you can have uh, n number of connections coming in from the app you can only uh, open m connections to the to the databases where you know m is what it can sustain so help in uh, um, reducing the number of uh, connection errors that the apps can see um caching is what we talked about let's say a uh, uh, web server does a query it goes to the secondary the results are sent and then in the process the data access layer saved a copy of this uh, response a similar query comes in from another server it directly serves it from its cache now this is an in memory cache uh, that's why the lookups are extremely fast and you can control at what time do you want to do the validation of the cache some um, some um, data administrator might want to say i want to do in validation based on time because i know when my tables are going to get updated uh, some might say that okay this this layer might has to have to be more intelligent and whenever a write comes or an update comes to this particular table invalidate my cache so that's a, a different sort of complexity that it adds but very simply it can do an in memory cache for your reads which um, uh, if you can i mean i'll share some links with you where you can look up the performance and it actually does very very high scale for reads um if you if you have an application which is uh, which has a lots of reads was there a question there yeah 
given a SQL um, query that, uh, let's say there are five tables involved in the query, and uh, one of those tables, uh, or more than one table gets written in a concurrent, you know, right. So what happens in that case? Right. So like I said, I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail on the solution, but like a couple of them I said, um, if you can uh, predictively know that your application is not going to do writes uh, on this particular table, you can do a TTL on, on this cache and say, just expire after five minutes and it's okay. Even if for five minutes you serve me stale data, that's okay. I think of the example of a inventory. Find it gets refreshed after five minutes. But if you want more um, consistency, then you would write something like, okay, make read all the inserts and updates. Make sure if you're touching any of the tables that you have cached, you invalidate them. If you do such a thing, then of course you're adding more extra complexity, and you know this uh, optimization uh, performance would actually be uh, affected. So, will uh, will it still make sense to use uh, your data abstraction layer? when such a scenario is correct? Absolutely. So we've, we've seen deployments where uh, this kind of requirements have come in, where you know we needed uh, um, exact consistency, and uh, we have configured the system in a way that we have auto-invalidation. A write goes in to the database, and immediately the cache gets invalidated through APIs, and it has worked fine. There's another uh, technique that uh, we incorporate. We give uh, small APIs to your application if you're okay to change your application a little bit, where wherever in your application you have a write call, just before that, if you just call in the invalidation API, that would hit our uh, layer first, invalidate the cache, and then the writes would execute. So there are many ways to actually solve that. Uh, okay, the next interesting um, use case I want to talk about is surge protection. protection. So uh, this is a case where one of the server goes down, and uh, and it happens to be your right server. Now it could it could be just down for maintenance, um, that uh, or it could be you know a real event. But during this time, what happens to the que to the queries that come in? So in this layer, you can actually have a surge queue where you are you know just caching or you're just holding all the writes till your right server is coming back. Of course, to a limited time. And when your right server comes back in, you're going to get forwarded. So. The clients will get delayed response, but they will not get, get errors. So this is very, very useful, and we've seen this multiple use cases of this in the field where somebody is trying to do uh, patches or upgrades uh, on their right servers, and they want zero-time maintenance. They just don't want their applications to see errors. They can uh, definitely make use of this feature. Read-write split, a very simple example of how load balancing can happen. You have reads and writes. You have one write server. You have multiple read servers. Why do you want to tax your write server with read queries? You might just want to spread them around on the read servers only. And it can intelligently do it by monitoring what is the load on these servers. If you have one server lying vacant, send it more load. If you have server which is busy, back off. Don't send a lot of data to it. Uh, Replication-aware load balancing, another very interesting use case. So you all understand the databases, if you have a cluster of them, they are replicating in the back end, right? Um, somebody was talking about journals before that in a, in a cluster file system context. Databases do something very similar. You write to a particular database, uh, to the right server, and then they ship their logs across to the uh, read replicas, where the read replicas are going to apply those logs, and that's how these two servers are in sync. But there is always a delay, right? And especially if you're writing a lot to one of the servers, there is going to be a delay on, this, on the secondaries. Now, if you get into a situation where one of your uh, slave servers are, is lagging behind, and the reason of its lagging behind could be because it is processing a lot of queries, do you think it's uh, wise to send more traffic to this server and make it continue to lag behind? Or would it be better if I just throttle back and say, okay, I will let you, I'll give you time and resources to catch up while I serve this traffic to the rest of the, to the databases. So that's what uh, I mean by replication-aware load balancing, where you are aware of what's happening in your database, how is the replication working on different nodes, and then you optimize your traffic accordingly. Um, query routing, another one. You can write rules to say, 
send certain queries only to certain kinds of servers. Maybe you have one of the uh, servers which is, you know, more powerful, does more reporting. You write queries uh, and you write rules on the data, ac data access layer saying, just send these kind of queries to this server. Um, enables the query routing feature. Um, I, this is the last one, sharding. I think, uh, how many of you have heard of sharding in databases? Wow, a lot of them, a lot of you guys, right? So, sharding is a very uh, good technique to distribute um, your load from the database end. You have a table with a million rows, um, you split them up, you know, 500,000 on one, 500,000 on the other one, so that as the query comes, you can now serve it from two different data stores, may most likely parallelly. But when you do sharding, how do you tell your application about it? Your application still thinks the data look lives on the in, in a contiguous uh, 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 data store. So what you would have to do is make your application aware of the shard. You have to write intelligence in your app to say, okay, if you're querying, you know, indexes from this range, go to database A. If you're sending queries to indexes from this range, send it to database B. Why touch your application when you now you can easily do it in the data access layer by just creating rules. This this thing is anywhere reading your queries, reading indexes, and then transparently sending the data um, to the appropriate servers. So, in a nutshell, uh, okay, I'm just gonna skip this. And interest of time. Yeah, so in a nutshell, what I was just trying to show is there are many use cases which affects the performance and the scalability of databases that can be solved by this architecture. And we don't have to rewrite our apps to NoSQL. We, have, we can use our current architectures, our current in infrastructures of databases, use the relational model, but still can have, can achieve scalability. Um, I'm just going to skip this. Uh, just there, these were certain sample uh, use cases that ScaleArc had solved. So Dell.com is uh, um, uh, deployed us during the Black Friday onslaught. You know they were they had crazy deals on their site all, all around the world. You know you can imagine millions of customers logging in and um, getting the database connection errors. So they deployed uh, ScaleArc solution and they could help sustain the, the peak. Um, Activision, which is the studio behind Call of Duty, when Call of Duty 3 went live, um, they did a sample test by just sending a certain uh, percentage of, uh, of the signed up users that they can go and try. And they saw that even that small percentage of users was not able to, I mean, their infrastructure was not able to sustain that. Imagine when they would have opened it up to the entire world, you know, what hell would have broken loose. So they could also help, uh, they could also use our solution to solve some of these things. And, um, another another um, company, Quicken, also did that. So that's about it. I think uh, if you want to get in touch with me and, and sort of learn more about what we are doing or about this particular space, uh, please get in touch with me. Uh, I uh, uh, coordinates are over here, and I would also love to connect with you guys in any way and learn from all the people who have shared very interesting things about DevOps and. Uh, and exchange ideas on you know what we are doing in our IT to to keep up with it. As you can imagine, um, with what we are doing, our footprint of or the matrix of things that we deal with is is very very large. You know, all the different applications uh, that uses and different kinds of databases, deployments in cloud, deployments in in physical infrastructure. So we would love to you know bounce ideas. Um, with that, that's it. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I can take more questions. Yes. Uh, your data access layer, what kind of uh, database technologies are the best suited for this layer? Uh, I didn't catch the last part. So the database technologies, right? You showed this initial slide of comparison. There's Oracle, there's MySQL. There... So what do we support? Yeah. What is the best suited, you think? Oh, what's, okay, so that's a hard one to, to answer because there are, there's multiple attributes over there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can buy, I mean, Oracle definitely serves the, the fattest, the biggest, the most expensive database. Uh, MySQL is a, you know, open source free uh, database that you can deploy. SQL Server comes around as another database. 
what is important here is that this layer has uh, capability to now work with multiple databases at a time. And in our experience, what we support is uh, right now MySQL, SQL Server, and Oracle, all three different kinds of databases. And given that a lot of these databases are closed, like Oracle is a completely closed database. You don't have any access to how they're doing, what is on the on the wire, you know. We had to do a lot of reverse engineering to understand what they're doing. That's where the intelligence of this layer comes about because in order to do what we are doing, you have to read and understand a lot about SQL, which they don't expose. MySQL, on the other hand, is the most friendly because you have the entire source code and you can understand how they're parsing queries, what kind of queries they are. So. That's where the complexity lies. How, how big is the cache that you maintain? How big is the cache uh, that we maintain? And I don't want to yeah. make this discussion about scale arc. I want to make it generic to anything. But this could be, you know, this could be a uh, implementation where you can have memcached doing caching for you. And how, how big memcached D can scale? Mm -hmm. I mean, we all understand, right? It's not something that will affect this solution. This solution only says, I have a query, and as long as you can tell me, that you can um, you can take the result from the cache, I can keep putting it in the cache, depending on how big my RAM is. And based on that, I can scale how much ever I want. Okay. Uh, we've seen cache, uh, you know, 64 GB cache and 128 mm -hmm. GB cache is being used, and so of, uh, millions of queries. Okay. Um, All right, thank you. Uh, maybe I missed it, but uh, what do I have to do from my code side uh, to basically make a connection to this? A very good point. Actually, I missed that part. So from the code side, you don't have to do any changes. That's the beauty of it. Because all you are trying to change, or maybe one change that you do is change your connection string. Okay, so it will work with JDBC and all that. Right. right? So it will work your, your existing JDBC, .NET, ODBC drivers. You're just saying that, okay, now my connection string goes to a different endpoint. Mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, just a follow-up question, do you have like something like a MySQL client has uh, so that I can run few queries from, uh, say, a shell script, I mean, without writing any custom code for that, anything like that? You can use your existing tools uh, to work with this directly. Like even with your MySQL client, okay. you ultimately give a, okay. a host okay. name and a port. Uh -huh. Instead of that, you can give the host name of the database access layer, and then you can see the query going through this machine. Uh, I mean, our product has a, a web portal where you go in and you can actually see your query in flight. And you can say what query you fired, how long it took, which server did it go to, and all the details. All right, cool. Thanks. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Three questions. Wow. <laughs> uh, first, uh, whether your layer is a single point of failure. Uh, secondly, is it based on uh, popular proxies like HAProxy or Varnish? And third, uh, it's, uh, how, how is the pricing? Okay, I, I'm not going to talk about pricing because this uh, is not about uh, our solution. This is a generic solution. And yes, it's a, it, this approach has the limitation of being a single point of failure, which you would have to address by means such as deploying a, a you know active-active pair or, or some sort of a high availability in this layer itself. That's how you address it. And what was the third question? Is it based on proxies like HA proxy or it is, is it based on proxy? No, it is not based on, on them, but um, uh, we all understand that this has to be a very fast uh, network proxy that also has to deal with a lot of application traffic. So it is an event-based uh, high-speed proxy, uh, and we all understand the proxy architectures. Uh, and it's deployed on normal Linux machines or SN appliance? Um, it ships, again, Scalarc software ships as a software appliance. There are RPMs available. You can just download them on any uh, CentOS-based uh, system. Thanks. All right. One last question. I think, yes, we are reaching the top of the hour. Uh, how do you horizontally scale uh, your database access layer? I mean, would you make multiple of them and put a database access layer, access layer on top of that? So. <laughs> uh, that's a very good question. Actually, somewhere I heard uh, this quote that uh, I can solve any, com any computing problem or any computer science problem by adding another layer. And which is, if you think about it, it's true. And I've seen, you know, hundreds of examples of that. So, so yes. You can actually put another uh, load balancer of some sort 
uh, on in front of us to solve the scalability problem of our machine if there is or this particular layer and we have real world deployments of that a um, lot of customers actually activision that i was showing has uh, uh, was uh, deployed in amazon and they used elb in front of us to then uh, distribute load to a bunch of uh, scale arc based uh, uh, solutions so yes you can do that absolutely great thanks uh, thank you everybody Wonderful. And uh, I would just take uh, one more second, and can we have a round of applause to all the organizers? All the organizers. This was a fabulous event. <laughs>